Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give-no-shit attitude and come out on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. Now you don't have to be a muscled up Celt in a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a 4 foot 11 Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Now most of these badasses are all too real. And while some of these are only legend, they're badass legends. The only prerequisite is Celtic blood and badassness. Alright, this week on Celtic Badass, Mountaineer Hamish McInnes. Now, Hamish McInnes was the badass Scottish mountaineer who chased Hillary to Everest on a shoestring and made pioneering climbs from the Amazon to the Alps and his native Scotland, even befriending movie stars along the way. Now, Yet despite an awesome climbing resume, he's known for more of the hundreds of climbers he's brought safely down from the hills of the Scottish Central Highlands. Now, he founded the Glencoe Mountain Rescue Association in 1961 and led the turnout team for more than 30 years, becoming known as the father of Scottish Mountain Rescue, or simply the Fox of Glencoe, for his cunning way of finding victims and the creative tools and techniques that he developed along the way to get them safely home. Now, McKinnis started climbing at age 14 when he spotted a neighbor loading ropes and strange gear and stuff. He asked to come along. The neighbor was Bill Hargreaves, and he took McKinnis to climb the Cobbler, a jagged peak in the southern highlands. Now, Hargreaves was a skilled and careful climber, and McKinnis learned quickly under his tutelage. At 16, he climbed the Matterhorn in Switzerland, and at 18, his compulsory military service took him to Austria, where he continued to climb and got his first taste of mountain rescue. Now, McKinnis was nearing the top of the Zugspitz with Hans and Marga Spielmann when a rock dislodged from above struck Marga directly on top of her head causing massive trauma. Now with Marga hanging on unconscious on the rope and her husband temporarily paralyzed with shock, McKinnis roped down to Marga, strapped her to his back, and descended to a patch of level ground. Then he went back up for Hans. He said, I knew very well it was just a race against time for her life, life or death, McKinnis recalled. Now, as luck would have it, the Zugspitz cable car was departing the top station when the accident took place and people on board had seen everything. The gondola lurched to a stop and someone shouted down. <laughs> Luckily, there were two neurosurgeons on board. Now, McKinnis uh, slung Marga onto his back and scaled the massive pylon Swinging over to the cable car, Marga Spielman made a full recovery, and McKinnis had tapped into a feeling more intoxicating than climbing alone. Now on exacting rescue, each moment is remembered with amazing clarity, he said, for one, lives, one lives at a higher pitch than usual when risks must be taken, which would normally be contemplated, he wrote later. Now, only too often it is a fight for life. There is nothing more satisfying than the successful evacuation of a critically injured person on a highly technical rescue, where a single mistake result in the death or a casualty. And he is quoted as saying, on a grand scale, it's a game of chance in which nature holds all the cards. Now McKinnis continued to push himself as a climber, often with members of the Critic Do climbing club, a group of tough young men from the shipyards of Glasgow who found freedom in the hills. Now in the winter of 1953, when McKinnis was 23, he and Chris uh, Bonington made the first ascents of Agex Grove, Crowberry, Ridge Direct, and Ravens Gully, all on Bucklevy out of Moor in Glencoe, the Highland Valley McKinnis would call home for the rest of his life. Now, in later years, McKinnis would make the first winter traverse of the Cullen Ridge on Skye and the first winter ascent of Zero Gully on Ben Nevis. But the rest of 1953 was consumed in a spirited attempt to beat Hillary and company to the top of Mount Everest. Now, it started 
of a lecture in Edinburgh by a member of the 1952 Swiss expedition who mentioned offhandedly that his team had left food caches a good way up the mountain. That strap of information formed the nucleus of McInnes's bold plan to get to the top of the world on the cheap. Now, <laughs> he scored a 10-pound assisted immigration passage to New Zealand where he met up with 26-year-old Craig Du Hardman Johnny Cunningham, continuing with him to Bombay and then on to Nepal. Now, they reached Everest Base Camp in late July 1953 with a borrowed tent, 150 pounds of potatoes, and a sheep. Hillary and Norgay had reached the summit, though, just seven weeks before, and McKinnis and Cunningham cheerfully changed their focus on a first descent of the nearby Pumori, climbing to about 22,000 feet before blizzards and avalanche risk forced a retreat. Now, the duo stayed in Nepal for a few more weeks, living on mutton soup and fried potatoes and bagging pingaro, well, I don't even know what that is, but a 20,000 foot peak McKinnis described in his account of the expedition as a wonderful spire of rock. Now, McKinnis would return six times to the Himalaya, joining Boynington's expedition to the south face of Annapurna in 1970 and climbing to more than 27,200 feet on the southwest face of Everest in 1972. Three years later, he served in Boynington's deputy leader on the first successful ascent by that route. Also on that expedition, McKinnis was caught in an avalanche and nearly swept to his death. It was hardly his first close call, though. In his many decades on the mountains, Mr. McKinnis was believed to be lost or dead on at least six occasions, sometimes during attempts to rescue other people. McKinnis went on to climb the French Alps in 1958. He finished the first British ascent of the Bonatti Pillar of the Petit Dru after falling rock fractured his skull. Wow, what a badass. Now, McKinnis was very well, well versed in the, uh, the calculus of risk and an inadvertent tinkerer and brought an engineer's approach to climbing safety. Now, he founded the Glencoe Mountain Rescue Team in 1961, led it for 30 years, participating in hundreds of rescues. He trained avalanche rescue dogs and co-founded the Scottish Avalanche Information Service and with Eric uh, Langmuir, and his most lasting innovations grew out of his long experience. The folding McKinnis stretcher was designed in the 1960s and became the standard throughout the world and uh, an all-metal ice, ma ice, ice axe in the late 1940s, but his decision to bring it to market didn't happen until nearly two decades later. He uh, kind of had a regret after a re uh, rescue call-out to Zero Gully where he found three dead bodies and two splintered wooden axes. This kind of lit a fire under his butt and his design evolved into the pterodactyl, the first drooped pick ice tool introduced in 1970. Now it opened new worlds of possibility in vertical ice climbing and in an attempt to standardize mountain rescue, he wrote the International Mountain Rescue Handbook. First published in 1972, used by every mountain rescue world, uh, team worldwide and has never been out of print since. Now McKinnis's climbing prowess and innovative badass mind also opened doors in the film industry where he frequently found work as a safety advisor, stunt double and cameraman for the climatic rope cutting scene in the Iger Sanction 1975. McKinnis rigged a pair of borrowed hotel ladders into a structure strong enough to cantilever Clint Eastwood and a camera operator 20 feet out from a sheer alpine face. He then climbed out onto the contraption to snap a photograph of Eastwood that landed on the cover of Alpinist more than four decades later. McKinnis, a fine writer who penned 35 books ranging from climbing guides to crime thrillers, the scene was filmed on the north face of the Eiger, but McKinnis also worked closer to home. In 2014, when he was 84, a neighbor found McKinnis unconscious at the back door of his home. He was diagnosed with dementia and institutionalized for 15 months against his will. The confinement of the psychiatric hospital was unbearable for McKinnis, who had spent his life seeking freedom in the hills. He did his best to escape, though, 
once climbing out an open window and onto the roof, scaling down two stories only to be caught once he hit the bottom. Now McInnes' illness was finally re revealed to be a chronic urinary tract infection, and with treatment he regained his freedom and razor wit, but not his memories, those he would have to reconstruct through painstaking effort and the study of books, photographs, and films from his many expeditions. He said, one of, one of the ways I clawed back my sanity was to watch all my old films. It's quite interesting thing. You feel as if you're a spectator looking in. Hmm. When he came out of care, all memory of his previous life had been gone, said filmmaker Robbie Fraser. What he did next, though, seems extraordinary. As well as undergoing physical and psychological rehabilitation with the help of his friends, he seems to have rebooted his mind. In the last chapter of his life, the canny fox of Glencoe, author of so many mountain rescues, ultimately had to rescue himself. In characteristic fashion, using persistence and creativity and the tools available to him, Hamish McInnes recollected his mind, pulling back from a seemingly bottomless void the memories of an extraordinary life. They were with him when he died in November 2020 at age 90. A total badass.